you. Can I um, call this meeting to order and can I welcome everyone to this, the ninth meeting of the Public Petitions Committee in 2019. Before um, we, we commence, I want to welcome uh, Lynn Russell as our new clerk and to wish uh, Sarah Robertson um, every good wish in her new post in the Environment Committee and thank you for all she did as the clerk to the Public Petitions Committee over the last period. We have one item in the uh, agenda this morning, which is a consideration of three continued petitions. The first petition is Petition 1698 on Medical Care in Rural Areas, lodged by Karen Murphy, Jane Rental, David Wilkie, Louisa Rogers and Jennifer Jane Lee. And can I welcome Rhoda Grant, MSP, um, for this agenda item. Having received submissions from the Scottish Government, Scottish Rural Action and the Petitioner, there remains a number of issues that require further scrutiny, including the Rural GP Association of Scotland's resignation from the Remote and Rural Working Group, the calculation of the Scottish Workload Allocation Formula and the implication of the new GP contract in rural parts of Scotland. At our previous consideration of this petition, 4th April 2019, we agreed to invite the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport to provide evidence on the matters raised in submission received to date, and I welcome today Jeanette Freeman. The Cabinet Secretary is accompanied by Sir Lewis Ritchie, Chair of the Remote and Rural Working Group, and Richard Foggo, Director of Population Health from the Scottish Government. Can I thank you all for attending this morning, and can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to provide a brief opening statement, after which we will move to questions. Thank you very much, convener and members, and thank you for the invitation to be here today. Let me begin by thanking the petitioners for bringing this important issue to the Parliament. The services they, and indeed we are talking about, are critical to the communities served. The focus of the petition is on two main issues. First, the new GP contract and its impact on rural general practice. And secondly, uh, Sir Lewis Ritchie's short life working group. I uh, want to make brief, brief remarks on both of these issues. The new GP contract negotiated with the BMA is Scotland's first standalone contract and has been in place for one year now. In that time, I know that some fundamental questions have been raised about whether the new contract values rural general practice and indeed whether it ultimately threatens rural general practice. So it is important that I state very clearly at the outset that we value rural general practice, and I do not believe that it is threatened by the new GP contract. Of course, rural general practice faces challenges, some of which are shared, like recruitment and retention, with practices in more urban areas, and some of which are unique, not least the remote geography and what that implies for GP practice. However, the new contract uh, doesn't cause these challenges, but is expressly designed to address them. The new contract does two things. First, it seeks to develop a new role for the GP as the clinical leaders in the community they serve, leading enhanced, more integrated teams to ensure that we continue to deliver the right care for patients at the right time. Secondly, it responds to the serious challenges identified by the GP profession of both increasing workload and risk in particular, the risk of owning property and employing staff. On both these points, I believe all GPs, whether urban or rural, can see real benefits from the new contract. The low role of clinical leader in the community, the expert medical generalist, is a role already fulfilled by many rural GPs. In that sense, the contract is intended to enhance and not diminish rural general practice and recognise the work that they do. The issue is whether the measures we are taking to reduce workload and financial risk, which include a new workload formula and bigger teams employed by health boards, diminish that role. I am absolutely clear that the GP contract and the associated primary care improvement plans have to allow for flexibility to suit local circumstance, in particular in rural communities. And I want to stress that there have been no changes to the GP contract in relation to services such as vaccinations. In a rural GP if a rural GP practice wishes to continue to deliver vac vaccinations or other services set out in primary care improvement plans, then it can do so, and GP practices continue to be paid to deliver this service. But we are also offering the opportunity to GPs to benefit from support from health boards if that improves outcomes for patients. 
While flexibility is important, I also believe it is wrong to suggest that a team-based approach does not suit rural communities. So, for example, in Western Isles, an integrated approach to vaccinations means uptake of flu vaccine among primary school pupils has increased from 67% to 74% since being transferred from GPs to school nursing teams. We have heard a number of concerns about the Scottish workload formula, which is a substantial component in determining the level of funding a GP practice receives. First, it continues to be said that rural practices have lost funding due to the new contract. This is categorically not the case. We invested 23 million to ensure that no practice loses funding. And in addition, we have increased the overall value of the GP contract by 23.7 million, an increase of 3.46%, which rural practices also benefit from. Secondly, it is said that because we are having to protect the funding of rural general practice, we don't value it. But my point would be that you protect what you value. I know that there is concern that protection might be removed at any point, and so rural general practice has been more fragile. Funding protection has been a feature of the GP contract since 2004. It was not an issue with the previous contract, and I don't believe it should be an issue now. I can, cannot envisage a situation in which a government of any political persuasion would remove this and thereby threaten rural general practice. The NHS depends on quality general practice. Finally, it's claimed that while the new formula better captures the variation in GP workload, it does not include the effect of geography on costs and so does not reflect the reality of rural general practice. But the funding steps I've outlined means that this change to the formula does not impact on the funding practices receive. Transparency is key to understanding the effect of geography on the cost of providing primary care services and the actual cost of running a GP practice, be it in an urban or a rural setting. <clears throat> so as part of the contract, we have agreed with the BMA that all practices will provide income and expenses data. This will significantly improve our understanding of the cost of delivering services across Scotland, including in our rural communities, a development the Parliament has explicitly welcomed. And once we have this information, we will be in a better position to refine the formula as necessary, a, a, a course of action that we will take into phase two of the GP contract. We recognise GPs in remote and rural communities work hard in exceptional circumstances, and I'd like to assure the committee that the fundamental aim of the working group, which Sir Lewis chairs, is to ensure that rural GP voices are heard and to bring about agreed actions on strengthening the implementation of the contract in remote and rural areas. The contract also impacts on patients and the wider primary care team, so there is both patient and multidisciplinary professional representation. Since its inception, uh, I think it's fair to say Sir Lewis has worked tirelessly towards building collaborative and trusting relationships, and I know that he will be happy to answer any questions the committee may have. They have, with his team, travelled extensively across Scotland, engaging with GPs, health board colleagues and rural communities to hear their views. I'm very grateful to him for uh, joining us this morning in order to uh, deal with any issues directly that you may have. There have been concerns that because the representative of the Rural GP Association of Scotland has resigned, that rural GPs are not represented on the group. Whilst we sincerely hope that uh, our GPAS send another representative, I do want to assure the committee that there are a number of rural GPs on the group and that the rural GP voice is being heard while discussions continue in order to uh, resolve the issue with our GPAS and I hope see them return to the committee. We're taking a truly transformational approach with the new GP contract. Our aim is not only to preserve general practice as a cornerstone of our health service in Scotland, but to ensure it flourishes and strengthens. I believe achieving this is possible by taking professionals and patients with us, building relationships and directly recognising that one size doesn't fit all. But as with everything worth doing, there is always room for improvement. 
uh, and we remain open to looking at how, in the, in the immediate term, but also in the second phase of the GP contract and the negotiations around that, some of the issues that people remain concerned about uh, can be considered fully and steps taken to resolve them. Finally, I'm grateful to the petitioners for taking the time to ask the questions, to challenge constructively and to allow me, at least in this part, to explain our intentions behind the contract. Thank you. Um, for that. Can I ask just before um, I go on to my, the substance of the questions I want to ask, um, what island proofing and rural proofing was done on the offer before the, the, the negotiation started? I'd ask Mr Fogel, who led the negotiations for us, to answer that. Um, there were two phases to uh, the proofing, um, which uh, happened before uh, the more recent uh, requirements around statutory island proofing. So the early stages of policy development, uh, we engaged through a series of roadshows and engagements around Scotland on the broad policy intentions and... ...about the, the, the level of consultation around those roadshows. I'm looking more at what kind of process as opposed to conversations you had, given there is a statutory responsibility now to do island proofing, but from that I think people would accept the rural proofing. So what was done to test the offer before you even took it to a place to consult on it? Um, so th that was the second phase. Um, so once the policy propositions were worked up, that went then into uh, the negotiating space, which was supported by um, there, there was evidence gathered uh, through various reviews in relation to the formula, and there was significant expert advice taken uh, to uh, turn the policy propositions into the contractual propositions. When we look at the paperwork, presumably we can see these are the propositions, this is what it will mean in an urban setting, this is what it will mean in a rural setting, this is what might have an implication in an island setting. That's all laid out before you go into negotiations. So, so the policy propositions are subject to a quality impact assessment, which does include an assessment of, of the impact on rural communities, yes. Explain why the evidence we've received is that this settlement means moving resource um, or greater resource of what's now available let me put this a different way, that urban areas do better out of the contract than rural areas, and better off areas within urban areas do better than poor areas. How, why, how could that possibly be if there was an equality impact assessment and a policy before you went into the negotiations? So I, I think it's worth saying just how complex uh, the GP contract is and just how many uh, considerations have to be balanced. I think, as the Cabinet Secretary have said, and, and I think also the BMA, have acknowledged um, a, a lot of those require judgment calls and balancing uh, a number of different competing factors. Uh, I, I should say two things. One is that no issue was specifically discussed more thematically in the negotiations than the impact on rural communities. Uh, and um, s secondly, we, we were in a position where uh, looking at all the different issues uh, that we had to consider, we were absolutely clear clear that some of fundamental propositions, in particular protecting income, was critical uh, to ensure, for instance, that there was no loss to uh, rural communities. To accept protecting income is not the same as enhancing income. Do you accept that the consequence of this contract of the funds that are available disproportionately go to urban rather than rural areas and within that disproportionately to more prosperous areas than poor areas within urban settings? Well, I think I would differentiate between two things. One is, was it our explicit intention uh, to frame uh, the negotiations and the outputs in that way? And the answer to that is absolutely not. Uh, there was no explicit judgment. The, the, the formula element in particular does balance and rebalances based on objective evidence in relation to deprivation and age, which reflects an objective assessment of the impact of an ageing population uh, and inequality in the Scottish population. That, that has a particular set of impacts in, in terms of urban and rural communities, but we came at it through the demographics, not through the nature of the communities well, impacted. I, I, even I wouldn't be so hard-hearted to suggest that you would willfully want to spend money on better off people than poorer people, but the evidence would suggest that that has been the consequence, and if an inequality impact assessment stroke rural proofing had been done, that would have been evident, would it not? And, uh, uh, or are, are you saying that that was a trade-off, it was an acceptable no, no, trade-off, no. that the consequences that deep end mm. surgeries in places like Glasgow would do less well than better off surgeries, and that 
rural areas do less well than urban areas? I think um, if the starting pr principle was that income needed to be protected. Um, so th the question is, if we applied the formula without that protection, and then I think your questions would be absolutely valid. Accept that there's been, you don't accept the evidence we've been given that the disproportionate benefit goes from poorer to better off and from rural to urban. You don't accept that? Uh, no, not, in that not expressed in that way. Okay. Um, forgive me. I, I, I wanted to ask about the, um, the, the letters from the Rural GP Association of Scotland, which was submitted to us um, and it was sent to the Rural Short Life Working Group announcing their resignation from this working group. I'm sure you'll agree that's a, a serious matter. And in connection with this matter, during the general questions um, on 4th of April 2019, the Cabinet stated that, so Lewis Ritchie has acknowledged the concerns raised by, raised by RGPS members and has agreed to hold further discussions in due course towards their continuing involvement in implementing the contract in our remote and rural communities. Can I confirm first that that working group cannot change the contract offer? So what the working group uh, can do is raise directly with me issues where they feel that the current phase one of the contract uh, requires modification and also where uh, they will want to uh, have a direct input into the negotiations around phase two of the contract. So they can change, we would advise... No, they can raise change. issues with me. Uh, remember, this contract is a product of negotiation between Scottish Government and the BMA. And so any modification to the phase one of the contract, any uh, changes that might be necessary at this point, uh, have to be uh, subject again to negotiation between uh, me and uh, BMA. What the, the group can do, and Sir Lewis Ritchie, I'm sure, will want to comment on this, is raise directly and evidence to me uh, issues that are raised with them that they conclude uh, should be looked at further by government and the BMA. So you'd be willing to consider um, a look at changing the terms of reference of the Short Life Working Group? Uh, we've already had that uh, conversation and we continue to have it with Sir Lewis. So you're willing to change the terms uh, of reference? As, as, it, as you know, convener, I am always open to improvement. Excellent. If in that case, if that were something that the, those who have resigned... Um, were expressing concern about, would that mean that you'd be willing to look at what their objections were in order to bring them back on board? I mean, I hear what you say about there are other rural people um, who could represent, but clearly there's an issue of folk who are serious about trying to represent rural GPs have resigned. So if this were something that would help, would you be willing to look at that? So, before I ask Sir Lewis uh, to comment on this, um, the, the other folk, as you put it, who are on this group are uh, representative of the, the experience of being a rural GP. And therefore, their views respect, are valid your and suggestion are was important. That, although people had resigned, it was OK because there were other people there who, who no. came from a rural experience. No. I'm asking you, are you willing to look at the terms of reference in order to bring these representatives back in who obviously thought so seriously and strongly about it that they resigned? Mm -hmm. So... Just before I bring Sir Lewis in, just for clarity and for the record, I didn't say it's OK that our GPAS have resigned because we have other rural voices. I said it was important to understand that there were rural voices on the committee and that we were working to see if our GPAS could return. I'll now ask Sir Lewis to bring you up to date with the work that he's undertaken in that regard. Can I ask you then, what is the extent of rural GP representation currently on the group? There are, there are about 10 general practitioners on the group and initially the group was made to consist only of general practitioners and officials. And one of my first requests was that we include a multidisciplinary uh, component and we have a nurse and, 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 and uh, an, an allied health professional on the group and we also have public representation. I was keen to make sure that that uh, was built in at the start. I was also keen to move forward very quickly to try and get some advice around how the public should best engage in developing primary care through the implementation plan. So, uh, in other words, I did not see this group as only being comprised of general practitioners 
because the future of, of primary care is not just confined to one discipline, it's a multidisciplinary endeavour. In relation to the resignation of David Hogg, that I found to be deeply regrettable in spite of my best efforts. What we're talking about is a contract that will transform general practice in Scotland because it needs to be transformed because of the changing needs of society. The problem of transformation is it's usually neither easy nor quick. But there are things that can move ahead more quickly and more pressingly than others. And your point, convener, about the terms of reference of the group, as well as the membership, I have requested both the government through the civil service and SGPC, the BME, to look again at the terms of reference of my group. It has been defined in the media as a task force for primary care. In its current form, it certainly is not that. But I do think the terms of reference need to be modified and modified in conjunction with the community we serve. So I have, I have asked that that should be considered and I understand that that is been accepted and will be considered. Um, uh, I just, can I just say that the uh, terms of reference will be considered at the group's next meeting at the start of June, uh, which I also in intend to attend. Okay. I mean, I, I accept that we need change and that change is complex, but do you share the concerns, or well, certainly that I have, I'm not sure, I can't speak for the rest of the committee, that those who want to deliver that change, who are absolutely the most committed, would you argue um, the GPs are serving that community and the teams round about them are expressing grave concerns about this contract. That is why the Short Life Working Group was established. I uh, and my colleagues have been travelling, as the Cabinet Secretary said, extensively throughout Scotland. If I'm asked to lead an important endeavour, one of the first things I do is try to listen to those who are active delivering on the front line. And we've been doing that and will continue to do that because I find that listening and to, to colleagues and observing the care they deliver informs improvement, not necessarily by questionnaires and by emails. I prefer to go out there. And I heard consistent concerns about being undervalued, about the new contract not helping uncertainty in terms of future planning, and that is the feedback that I have been giving both of the government and we have been discussing in the Short Life Working Group. That's a diagnostic phase, if you like. So, so you know, if you use a medical analogy, first of all, what's wrong here? And that takes a little time to, to assimilate. But then we need to get to the treatment phase. And I'm hoping that the meeting on the 4th of June, which will be a workshop meeting, it will not be a committee meeting, uh, I hope we'll be bringing other voices in so that we can look at all of the issues and determine a way forward. I've had a number of meetings with uh, Scottish Government civil servants and the SGPC, the BMA, uh, to map out the near future. Uh, and I am assured that both the BMA and the government will produce a joint statement following the workshop uh, in June to give clarity about the next steps. And I have committed to write a report uh, of progress in relation to implementation of the new GP contract uh, by the autumn. I will hope to lay out the problems. I will also hope to lay out examples of best practice. Uh, these are emerging. It's early days. Uh, uh, but they need to be assimilated and spread where good and lessons learned where things have not worked and also be appropriately communicated. And if I may just say that the word communication is all important in this matter. I'll pause there, convener. It's always encouraging if a doctor accepts there's something wrong and is willing to make a diagnosis. So that's, I mean, that, that, I think that sense that perhaps there's an acknowledgement there's something wrong here um, is, a, is a good starting point. <coughs> Ryan Whittle. Thank you, 
Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary Sir Lewis, uh, Mr. Fogel. Can I can I just start uh, with a clarification on on uh, this line of question the convener was was uh, uh, pursuing there, and and can I ask you do, you do you accept that there is a migration of GPs from rural to urban, especially to to, to the better off areas? I'm not aware of any. Uh, clear objective evidence to support that. I'm not saying that is not the case, but I've not seen objective evidence to support that. What there is, uh, and I, I do accept, which is why we've taken a number of steps, are issues around the recruitment and retention of GPs in remote and rural practices. Okay. I think I think we would suggest that we we have been gathering evidence to suggest that, that, that there is that there is that migration. However, um, so can I say that, that if that is the case, and if you do have that evidence, then I would certainly welcome sight of it, so that we can consider that in terms not only of our current uh, implementation of phase one of the contract, but also as we enter in, into negotiations for phase two. I think it would also be something so Lewis would be interested in. Mm -hmm. And it also, of course, plays to our wider workforce. So if, if that evidence is there, then I would be very happy uh, to see it. I think, I think also in that respect, I think most of us have got mailbags uh, where we have uh, GP surgery struggling in our areas and, and they're actually uh, moving to an urban, an urban setting. A lot of GPs are doing that, so I think I think we could quite easily gather quite a bit of evidence to suggest that that, that, that is the case. However, if I could just go on, in, in the words of the petitioner, Scottish Rural Action highlights that there are serious GP and other health with worker recruitment and retention issues in rural areas. And whilst measures have been taken to address this concerning and costly issue, I think it's common sense that GP contracts need to be attractive. So I'm going to ask why was the Technical Advisory Group on Resource Allocation, which provides advice on all resource allocation decisions in the NHS, specifically prevented from providing an opinion on the impact of the Scottish Workforce Allocation Formula, when it was obvious it would disadvantage rural practices and uh, that already had difficulty in recruiting? So I'm going to ask uh, Mr Fogo to um, uh, give you a more detailed answer to this. Um, but I think I'd, I'd say two things. One, it, it was not, from my understanding, specifically prevented, uh, as you describe it. And secondly, uh, TAGRA is there to discuss resource allocation. What we are talking about in the GP contract is around pay. Uh, and it, it's not easy uh, to uh, straightforwardly uh, combine the two into one area. But TAGRA did have a role here, and I'll ask Mr Fogo, to describe that to you. Yep. So, as the Cabinet Secretary has set out, TAGRA does have a role around resource allocation. Um, a, a, a difficulty that we have acknowledged, both ourselves and the BMA, is that there's a complexity around GP funding, which is that it, the GP funding covers the amount of money that we believe is right to provide and underpin GP services in those communities. But that funding also provides GP pay. So the negotiations that we have with the BMA are effectively a pay negotiation, which also take up the question of resource allocation. Um, now, the pay negotiations are, as you would expect, confidential. And that has a very particular impact on the transparency of those negotiations and our ability, getting back to the points raised by the convener earlier, for us to engage openly uh, with the public and with others in relation to what is happening in the negotiating room. However, in this case, TAGRA were involved in the evidence gathering that allowed us to review the original Scottish allocation formula. And at a number of meetings, TAGRA received updates as to the development of that work and received the outputs to that work. So TAGRA were involved in the gathering of evidence and then at the point where a decision had to be made about the application of the formula, that was a matter for negotiation. The Scottish Government and the BMA have accepted that in future it would be better if resource allocation could be separated from considerations of GP pay, and that is an explicit aim of phase two of the contract. If that were to happen, then as with board allocations, then we could have a higher degree of transparency around the allocation formula for general practice, um, and therefore, TAGRA may have, under those circumstances, a clearer role. 
but the combination of a pay negotiation which is confidential, and essentially so, and a consideration of how we re allocate resources added a complexity that made it difficult, ultimately, for TAGRA to offer its definitive advice. Can I just say, I think, and, and um, I'll, I'll uh, ask it just to be, make sure, keep me, keep me right here, convener, but I think it's, it's our understanding that your assertion of the involvement of TAGRA goes against the evidence that we have. So I think if I could ask that um, perhaps we could, we could get some perhaps follow-up uh, on that. Just make one further clarification. If, if the question is, were TAGRA asked to advise on the final decision to apply the, fo the new formula to the GP contract, then the answer to that is no. Uh, the information that, that was informing your decision, what you were going to offer? The, the my understanding is that TAGRA was stood down from being involved in this from 2016, so they wouldn't have seen any of the detail after that? The, the, the evidence of the review of the initial Scottish allocation formula was available uh, to TAGRA. Then we established an expert advisory group separate from TAGRA to offer us advice about the development of the new formula. And they didn't get the further information and were stood down from a process that they would normally have been involved in in the past? Uh, no, t t I don't th TAGRA would not necessarily have been involved in that and they were not explicitly stood down. We established an expert advisory group specifically to allow us uh, to deal with the evidence in the context of the negotiations. Well, why is the Scottish work, Workload Allocation Formula analysis based on data from a small group of highly unrepresentative practices which stopped collecting data in 2013? And if I set this in context, uh, these PTI practices stopped receiving funding at that stage because the Scottish Government considered the data to be useless. This issue is raised in a, a, a further petitions PE 1698D and PE 1698E, yet it remains unexplained why this data was used. Scottish Rural Action notes that the community response to this uh, concerns expressed by rural GPs has been significant and should not be ignored, yet this remains unanswered and ignored. Well, I, I don't believe it is ignored. Um, my understanding is that... Uh, the, the most up-to-date data uh, the ISD had was at 2013, uh, ended at 2013, and ISD then stopped collecting the data because they had to take the time to build a new platform called uh, Spire, uh, and that now that that is moving to be in place, that together with the uh, objective data that we touched on earlier around uh, costs and expenses and so on uh, will now feed into phase two of the GP contract, which will, with, on the basis of uh, that more up-to-date data, allow us to review uh, the formula along with the other matters that need to be discussed at the phase, at phase two. The beginning of which, my understanding is that the uh, data on expenses and costs and so on will be uh, available to us in, from November of this year. But the rest of that... Uh, supplementary, uh, in terms of supplementary information, perhaps Mr. Fogel wants to take us through. Yeah. So we, we, we did go out to seek further data that would allow us uh, to form uh, a more refined judgment. We ultimately went out to 600 GP practices asking for them to provide us uh, on a voluntary basis the data that would allow us to refine our assessment. Uh, we only had 109 responses uh, to that and that was that therefore not able to provide us with a robust enough basis to update the PTI information. I should say that the PTI information is the most robust information we have to hand uh, and that the data and assessment used was refined, methodologically improved, and we changed the census date, we moved to a data zone approach, so there were a number of methodological improvements uh, to our assessment of uh, that data. And a second point I think I should make is, just to be really very clear, the um, assessment of workload is not tracking real activity or, or real GP workload. There is some suggestion in submissions to this committee that, for instance, in areas that are under-doctored or whether there are, whether there are issues in which uh, coding of cons and consultations uh, have reduced in some way that will have a direct impact on GP funding. Again, that's a misunderstanding that I would be happy to correct for this committee in relation to the methodology of the formula. The formula does not track actual consultation rates or read codes. It looks at the population 
that those practices serve, it adjusts for the age and sex and other characteristics, then it forms an assessment of notionally how many consultations would a population with those characteristics generate. And that generates a factor which then allows us to determine the allocation of resources. So the, the fact that for a period of time, fewer consultations happened, or a, a GP was on leave, or there was an error in the, the coding system, all of those things uh, are accounted for. So the 2013 data was sufficient for us uh, to form judgments, but as the Cabinet Secretary have said, we have an ambition to have a much more up-to-date and transparent data set, and we've secured through the contractual negotiations for the first time uh, a, a contractual um, obligation on GP contractors to provide that data. Therefore, we will not have 109 practices, but we should have the, the data from all 950 practices. So, can I kind of then, take, then what you're saying there is that uh, you, the assertion that the Scottish Government considers the data to be useless, you would, you would disagree with that? I, I absolutely would dis I wouldn't understand uh, in what regard it was useless. Okay, I'm just saying that, that that's what the, we, the, the evidence that we are taking. That's what the suggestion is, and also the suggestion here. I, mean, I, th I think what concerns me is, you know, we're, we're bringing forward here uh, the petitioner's con uh, concerns, um, and the Scottish Rural Action Group here are saying that uh, the, the concerns expressed by GCP, GPs have been significant and remain unanswered. And the only answer I'm getting back from you is, that's not true. Well, to be fair, I think you're getting a bit more than that's not true. You're getting an explanation of how we worked on the basis of data that was uh, 20, uh, 2013 uh, data, recognising that, that that was not as adequate as we would wish it, and then uh, undertaking a number of methodological and other changes and checks to try and get it to the place where we could sensibly rely on it whilst we uh, take forward into phase two uh, more objective and up-to-date gathered data. Now, the choice at the point of phase one of the contract is to say the data we've got is 2013 data. That will no do no matter what we do with it. Um, so how do we go forward when we actually have a contract that has to be negotiated? And what Mr Fogel has described to you is how efforts were made to ensure that using the 2013 data, it was uh, improved in order to be as robust as it could be made for the purposes of phase one of the contract. But phase one of the contract also includes now an obligation on all 950 GP practices to provide up-to-date data for us so that we can use that in phase two. Well, why did Deloitte not make the effort to obtain more up-to-date and representative data? I think the cost of obtaining fresh data, a fresh data set would not be prohibitive. And the contract was introduced, I think, with haste and concerns about the SWF dismissed with the cause for the concerns not addressed, as, as Scottish Rural Action are saying here. Uh, Scottish Rural Action considers threat to health services need to be addressed transparently and urgently Yet the Scottish Government, again, they're saying, has yet to respond to this question. Well, well, I, I think that is an unfair uh, claim by Scottish uh, Rural Action, uh, that the Government is not responding to the concerns in terms of the delivery of rural health care. I'm not going to repeat and recite all the various steps we've taken, nor what we have said clearly this morning, that there is more work to do to ensure that the contract adequately uh, reflects the needs across all our communities in Scotland. But to say that we are not doing anything, I think, is both untrue and unfair characterisation of our current position. I don't think they're saying you're not doing anything. What they're saying is you're not responding and informing. Yeah. Um, can I add one thing? Um, the, the, a characterisation I, I, I wouldn't accept is in relation to our attempts to secure additional data. Just, just to remind you what I said, we went out to 600 practices to ask for that data. Uh, and we, were, we indicated that we would cover the cost of collecting that data. Only nine, 109 practices responded, insufficient in rural communities. I would note that that would have been an opportunity for rural general practice uh, to provide us with the data that underpins their assessment. And despite offering to pay 
uh, for the collection of this data. I, I note the point is made that it would not have been prohibitively expensive. Indeed, it wouldn't have cost anything because we were prepared to subsidise it. Um, I'm afraid uh, general practices were not able, uh, for, for many reasons, including uh, uh, they're hard pressed and, and their workload, they were not able to come forward uh, with the data. So I would just like to correct one point, which was that we made no attempt to update the data available to us. We made every attempt to do so, but unfortunately general practices did not feel able, despite the offer of payment, to provide us with the data on a voluntary basis. Hence, we've had to make a contractual commitment on GP contractors that they provide us with that data, which is in line actually with what uh, this parliament has said previously in relation to transparency around GP funding. It would be interesting to, to, to find out actually why such, there was such a low response rate, I have to say. That would be interesting. Did you ask them? Did you ask them why they didn't respond when clearly this is an issue that's very alive? To um, we, we returned to GP practices on numerous occasions uh, to seek further volunteers. As I say, ultimately 600 practices including a subsidy for providing the data to ensure it was not financially uh, penalising practices to provide the data. Uh, numerous occasions, we, Deloitte and others, the BMA, the BMA through their own local, local contacts encouraged, indeed exhorted their local practices to provide this data, understanding in particular in rural communities that if rural general practices provided that data at that point, then we would have been able to make potentially a different assessment of where we stood. So I, I know Sir Lewis Ritchie made the point that he prefers to talk to people rather than to, to email them. I wonder if you've had any direct conversations with rural GPs who didn't engage in this process, which you, you know, it, it all seems terribly reasonable. Why on earth wouldn't they? I just wonder if you've asked them why they, ha why they didn't. Uh, what I can... Uh, yes, so what, is, yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah. Yes. Uh, if I may, my contribution to this, this, this formula, uh, the... The ISD stopped, I, I know this as a fact, ISD stopped collecting the data in 2013 because it coincided with the uh, replacement of a national GP computer system with commercial alternatives. Uh, and as Mr Fogo says, there was not in place uh, an alternative and that's now been worked on. In fact, I flagged this some years ago that as I knew that the national system was going to be uh, dis disbanded, then we had to have a robust alternative in place, and that has been worked up. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll stop on that, but what I will say about formulas is that they do not express the richness of general practice in the round, and I think in particular they do not account for the diversity of practice in remote and rural areas. So I would be saying to the government that any future development should be informed not just by formulas but by also looking at what GPs do in remote and rural areas because they do different things. A GP in a remote and a rural area can be a nurse if the nurse is sick, can be a paramedic if the ambulance is out of area, attends to a road traffic accident the diversity there is quite stark at times. So, for example, in a very remote island, a GP may work all day to keep a sick patient at home, avoiding a air evacuation. And that happened very recently with one of my colleagues. No formula will account for that. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we need to be more sophisticated at looking at what our rural colleagues do, the diversity of what they do, how well they do it, and how best that needs to be resourced and supported. And as I see it, I would like to shed a little light on that with my group. Brian, and then I'll... Well, just a, a very brief supplement. Having, having said that, uh, and I appreciate that, that uh, Sir Lewis, was this not taken into consideration when first... Mm -hmm. We're producing the, the GP contract at stage one. We, we, we know this to be the case. Was that not taken into consideration? I, I, I can't answer that. Mr Fogo may want to respond. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely, absolutely it was. Um, there was a very active consideration for the reasons that Sir Lewis has stated, which, which are well known, uh, and a limit on any formula-based, weighted capitation formula-based uh, approach. 
um, at, that we actively considered in negotiations removing small remote rural general practices from the formula altogether. We actively considered it for that reason. I should say now um, that the reason that we decided collectively with the BMA not to proceed with that was actually for precisely the reasons that have now come to pass, that by separating out small remote rural general practices from the overall body of the GP profession, our fear was that we'd be portrayed as marginalising rural general practice. So in fact, we made the decision uh, to keep them in the formula precisely to ensure that they felt part of the overall GP profession in Scotland and to avoid marginalisation. Um, so we actively considered removing the small, remote, rural general practices from the formula approach. Rachel Hamilton. Um, I'm just trying to uh, grasp this because if, first of all, the metrics were... Um, you've acknowledged that perhaps the metrics weren't um, taken into consideration or were right um, uh, for rural uh, practices, um, but also... Um, the, the information gathering from ISD had stopped, I think Sir Lewis Ritchie said in 2013, um, plus there wasn't an uptake uh, of, of um, giving information from the um, GPs that maybe there should be some sort of pause on this until there is the right information. Um, but I completely accept Sir Lewis, Sir Lewis Ritchie's points here about um, some of the issues that my own um, GP practices have in the constituency, such as um, was the uh, Scottish workload allocation formula, did uh, other factors such as um, taking into consideration providing health services to seasonal workers or tourists, um, has, has that been taken into consideration as well? Bef before I ask uh, Mr Fogel to answer that specific point, um, um, I think I, I should say two things. I think your, um, uh, your characterisation, if you like, if I'm right, and I think your colleagues, we, I think we would share this, is that there are a number of um, issues in the negotiation around phase one which were not as ideal as we would wish them to have been. There are reasons for that um, that I think are understood. Um, and attempts were made, for example, as we've discussed in some detail, around the data to ensure that notwithstanding uh, the fact that it was uh, our starting point was 2013 data, effort was made to uh, try and ensure that was robust for the purposes of the negotiation. And uh, Deloitte, of course, were involved in that, as well as the other matters. But, but I think I want to make two points. Um, in terms of the question about a pause... Um, actually, the fact that the contract is in phase one and phase two, in effect, allows us uh, in phase two, which begins reasonably shortly, to take account of some of the issues that have emerged uh, so that we can uh, consider again what more might be done with the formula and indeed perhaps revisit that difficult question that was uh, there in phase one, which was whether or not to remove remote and rural practices from a formula. Uh, and the decision made, as Mr. Fogel outlined, a very, it's, you can call it one way or the other. It is essentially a judgment call as to whether you risk people perceiving they've been marginalized if you remove them, or whether you retain it in one uh, Scottish GP family, if you like, uh, and then carry the risk of some of the issues that we're discussing emerging point I'd make is that there isn't a formula that is set in stone. Um, equally, there isn't a formula that will ever be perfect, but the opportunity to review uh, how adequate the, the formula is or isn't uh, is there, and that's why uh, the work of Sir Lewis's group, consideration of its terms of reference, how that, along with more up-to-date objective data, is fed into phase two uh, is really important and important for us to understand that this is not um, a completely final, no change is possible, no improvement is possible position at all. And there, there is consideration at this point as to whether or not in advance of phase two, not least in terms of reference 
of Sir Lewis's group, but any other uh, more pressing issues that we might move on in discussion with the BMA, because I repeat, it is a contract, it is negotiated. The BMA are the other major player in this. It's not entirely at our hand. It has to be negotiated whether or not there are steps that we can take before the conclusion of phase two to address some of these issues. But on your specific point about um, seasonal workers, tourists and so on, um, there is a, a particular uh, position on that. Which yeah. um, so, so again, generally, uh, we, we, we must understand that the application of the formula in totality without income protection would have been inconceivable to us. And a number of the hypotheticals that are run seem to be suggesting that the application of the formula, which thereby would not reflect the complexity of rural general practice, would result in uh, an underfunding of rural general practice. So the income protection is a critical component. The second point I would make is that the existential threat to general practice presented to us from the BMA included workload. So the question of why not pause was that two-phase approach, which was to say that there were very many practices in Scotland, including some in rural general practice, but uh, elsewhere in Scotland, that were confronting a very serious workload challenge. And it was the BMA's contention to us that along with income protection to ensure that no practice lost out, that we needed to invest to capture that additional workload. Hence why we went forward with the workload formula along with income protection. The third point about seasonal workers, um, all practices, whether they're urban or rural, um, receive a fixed temporary patient adjustment for unregistered patients. And, and we have committed to look at uh, the, the ebbs and flows around patient lists. So whether that be increased registered patients or whether it be unregistered temporary, we have committed to look at that regime uh, to make sure that it's up to date. But absolutely, every practice in Scotland receives adjustments uh, to accommodate for that. W whether those indexes are as up-to-date as they need to be, uh, whether the regime is as, uh, as good as it could be, absolutely, we completely agree. If we had better data, we would be able to form a better judgment on that. But at the moment, GP practices are compensated um, to reflect those ebbs and flows. Thanks, um, Kavina. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, a number of the issues with regard to um, the Scottish workload allocation formula that I was going to ask have, have already been covered. Um, however, I was interested to hear Sir, Sir Lewis uh, uh, allude to the situation in, in remote islands. Um, and I, I should perhaps declare uh, or uh, refer members to my register of interest at this point. Um, g given the concerns uh, we've heard, would, would you still consider removing small remote general practices from the, the formula in the future, uh, notwithstanding um, your view that it would be marginalising? Can, can I just be clear? I'm not saying it is my view that it would be marginalising. I'm saying that in the discussion... Uh, nor did Mr Fogel say that. In the discussion, the debate that was held was whether or not there was a risk that in removing remote and rural practices from the, the main formula, that, th that those practices would perceive themselves to be marginalised. That was a, an issue that was raised um, by the BMA. And in the discussion that followed uh, in terms of the negotiation, the final decision was taken uh, not to risk that. No, uh, that doesn't mean that that is not an issue to return to. There are clearly uh, improvements to be made, not least based now on the improved data that we will have, that we anticipated to have in advance of phase two, put contractually into phase one, on some of the issues that have been raised um, uh, through yourselves, but but primarily through uh, Sir Lewis's work uh, and so on, to consider um, what, what modification can be made to the formula to better reflect those concerns and that variety of practice between rural and urban practices in terms of what GPs actually do. Now, whether or not that means you then remove remote and rural practices from the formula or whether you find other ways to adequately address that diversity is part of the discussion that goes into phase two, informed 
uh, and uh, involving uh, the views that come via uh, Sir Lewis's uh, group, but also uh, others. So that's why I said my point is no formula is set in stone. There, uh, what we have at the moment clearly isn't perfect. There are issues that need to be addressed. We need to look and see how best we address them. Do we do that by removing remote and rural? That question will be returned to. There may be alternatives to doing that, and we have to have that discussion and see. Okay, thank you. I don't know if Sir yeah, Lewis okay. wants to one, add. One of the, one of the um, uh, responsibilities of a chair, apart from trying to care and support for those around the table, and I have spoken regularly, including last night, with the chairman of our GPAS and active seen her in her practice twice, I'm deeply committed to get all of these voices heard. One of the things we are doing, though, is your opening comments, convener, uh, was about my terms of reference. We've already covered that. But as a responsible chairman, I would not just try and deal with what's in the tin lid of the remit, but look laterally and try to think how we can actually do better than just addressing specific issues. So in that regard, we've, uh, we've, got a, we've just received an international literature review research of what might be best practice in other countries, which, which clearly also experience remote and rural situations. So we, we can learn from others, uh, would be the, the, the guiding principle there. Uh, I'm also asking the government to, to sponsor a descriptor of what is distinct about general practice in remote and rural areas. So we actually uh, see what that richness is. We can look at that in greater de detail and then move in that. And again, on the international dimension, I, I'm also garnering the opinions uh, of uh, remote and rural practitioners who have experience of developing models elsewhere. Uh, all of that I would like to see being included um, going forward, including the support of Healthcare Improvement Scotland, a national agency, and potentially others, including uh, National Services Scotland, in terms of their programme support capacity. All of that I see as being on the table going forward to try and help our colleagues in remote and rural areas. I beg the question why this wasn't done at the beginning, if we're committed to an equality impact assessment and understanding of rural and, and island proofing. Um, can I ask David Torrance? Good morning, panel. Um, the wide range and additional medical services offered by many GPs in rural communities and the isolated nature of the relocation, why was this additional workload not taken into account um, during the Scottish workload allocation formula analysis? Well, I think to some extent we have uh, <coughs> answered uh, a, a large part of that. Um, I, I should make the point that um, uh, whilst there, there may be uh, justification in some of the um, propositions that some of what is being discussed now uh, could have been better taken into account in the negotiation around uh, phase one, uh, I think it's it's fair to say that they were taken into account, but what is important is that as we implement phase one of the contract, we are open and willing to look at those improvements. Uh, and that is in large part why um, Sir Lewis's group was not only established, but that he was asked to chair it, and that we are looking at strengthening and clarifying the remit of that group. In terms of how some of those issues were taken into account, I'm happy to ask Mr Fogel to respond to that. I should say, though, whilst our focus here, rightly, is on remote and rural uh, general practice, some of the issues in terms of complexity of workload uh, and demand on GPs, of course, also applies in a different way, but nonetheless applies to our practices in more uh, urban settings, the convener has already mentioned, the deep end practices, they carry a, a slightly different name here in the East, but nonetheless they are uh, practices dealing with a complex cohort of patients with many differing and demanding needs. And the um, uh, contract and the formula needs to be able to take account of that too. I, I mean, I, I wouldn't add much to that other than to say some of that complexity is captured through other 
um, uh, means of remuneration, so not all of it is captured through the GMS contract. A number of rural general practices carry other contracts uh, to provide other services, including things like community hospitals. The general point, I think, has already been made uh, that no formula is able to, to pick up on all that complexity. In relation to workload, uh, absolutely we would accept that the better data set we have, the more able we are to pick up uh, on our conception of workload. Um, the, the consideration we brought to bear, um, the, the comment was made, I think, that uh, why didn't we consider these things during negotiations? I can absolutely assure you, having been in the negotiating room for two years, all these matters were considered at some very considerable length, and, and judgments ultimately uh, were made, uh, and we're open to revisit some of those judgments. So once we have that more up-to-date data in relation to GMS services, we will be in a position uh, to reflect on uh, that workload and the judgment will then be is that capturable through a formula or indeed does it have to be handled in a different way. Complexity of general practice was the main consideration in relation to the formula. Not just the complexity of rural general practice which includes the kind of logistical workload, the extra travel, all the other factors in relation to cost but also the nature of consultation and engagement in clinical practice but equally, there, were, there are other complexities in general practice which include, covered in the submissions, around issues such as unmet need, which is in incredibly difficult for us to capture in any formula, given its potential infinite nature. David? Um, I think you've answered most of my question in the next part, but can I ask, uh, Scottish Rural Action notes that recent decline in life expectancy in rural communities in the new west coast of Scotland health needs assessment report, how would you respond to petitioner's concern that the Scottish workload allocation formula is adding to this inequality? Uh, I'm sorry, could you just repeat that? Um, the Scottish Rural Action notes that the recent decline in life expectancy in rural communities in the new west coast of Scotland health needs assessment report. How would you respond to a petitioner's concern that the Scottish workload allocation formula is adding to this inequality? Um, well, I'd, I'd take an assertion like that very seriously indeed, and, and I'd want to uh, discuss with uh, the petitioners uh, in what way they think the contract contributes uh, to that situation, as opposed to a range of other matters that we are attempting to address through the health portfolio. Um, so I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a serious contention uh, in terms of the workload formula having an impact on life expectancy of patients, uh, and it would be a matter that I would want to seriously consider, but to understand the basis on which uh, that assertion or, um, or that concern is being expressed, um, because it's not immediately clear to me why that would be that link would be made. Um, but I don't know if either Sir uh, Lewis or Mr. Fogel want to add anything to that. I mean, again, we, we can provide this committee with considerable detail uh, on the technical and methodological underpinnings of the formula, which includes the demographic characteristics of the population, including deprivation, age, etc., all of which are protected characteristics. So that relates to the quality impact assessment. And again, judgments are formed. We are quite clear that we pr placed a particular weighting on age and deprivation in the assessment of the formula. We understood that the additional costs in the provision of rural general practice were mainly in relation to expenses and the costs of running uh, those particular businesses and, and reflected that we would have to consider uh, those costs in phase two. Um, so I would be very happy to provide this committee with all the underpinnings which sets out in, in, in incredible detail all the different component parts of the formula and how they capture the different demographics. Uh, but, but like the Cabinet Secretary, I, I, I have no evidence, and given the contract is only one year on, it's very difficult to see that we could in any credible way be seeing an impact on, on life expectancy at this stage. That, is a, as the Cabinet Secretary said, is a very serious point. Um, and I, I would imagine it's quite early for there to be evidence of that directly, so we'd be very interested in that evidence. Evidence that the settlement disproportionately benefits better off areas in urban settings as opposed to poor areas in urban settings and disproportionately takes money into urban settings rather than rural settings. We accept that. 
We also have the body representing our uh, rural GPs saying there's a major problem here. And I don't know whether the Cabinet said to that particular assertion, it's clearly a very serious one, whether it would be possible um, to ensure that that conversation was held directly, and that's for you to establish yourselves. We wouldn't um, want to um, engage with that, but clearly that is something that is felt very strongly. Can I ask before I, I bring in Rachel, um, two things. When do you think phase two will start? And other than through the efforts of Sir Lewis Ritchie, how do you hope to engage with um, our GPS to encourage their involvement in phase two? Uh, so, uh, as I said earlier, um, the uh, data that will be gathered um, from practices that is now part of uh, phase one of the contract uh, should be with us in November of this year. And we would expect phase two uh, of uh, the contract in terms of uh, the, the beginnings of the negotiation, if you like, around that. So there's a lot of preparatory work and discussion uh, between November uh, and that point uh, to be uh, from the spring of 2020. And so Sir Lewis's um, report will inform Indeed. what happens in November? Indeed. Okay. And to answer the second part of your uh, question, um, so Sir Lewis's report will absolutely inform uh, all of that consideration. Uh, the, the primary uh, way to uh, engage uh, our GPAS uh, in the work of Sir Lewis's uh, group is uh, taken forward by Sir Lewis. I think that is entirely proper. If at any point he thinks there is value in a further discussion between myself and that body, then uh, I'm always open to do that. I've uh, had, I think, last summer uh, a couple of uh, discussions uh, with them, um, with um, David Hogg, um, but I'm very happy to discuss them with them again, but I would take Sir Lewis's advice on what is the best way to deal with that. Okay, thanks. Uh, Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, convener. Um, the new uh, GP contract, along with the memorandum of understanding, sees that health boards will take on the responsibility or some responsibility for secondary care services um, and non-core services, which will allow GPs to um, free up time for primary care. However, in rural settings, um, this is not necessarily happening, and I wondered... You mentioned um, some good figures, um, Mr. Fogo, uh, around the flu vaccine uh, in the Highlands and Islands. Now, um, I didn't quite pick that up, if you'd like to repeat it, but I just wondered how vaccine transformation it, it might be compromised because of the, um, the, the rollout of these services and the geographical um, considerations that rural GPs have to take into consideration. And I'm actually speaking from experience, again, from having spoken to GPs in my own area, where they believe that the vaccine transformation isn't being delivered as they would like it. So uh, uh, let me make a couple of points, and then um, I think uh, Mr. Fogel may well want to add to that, and, and indeed Sir Lewis may want uh, to make a couple of points as well. The first, the first thing to say is that the... Um, the alternative provision of immunisation programmes is an offer. Uh, it's not compulsory. And so uh, for some remote and rural GP practices, uh, the example was one that I gave, uh, was the Western Isles, uh, where they feel uh, that having taken up that offer, um, there has been an improvement. But I'm equally conscious that in other uh, practices, uh, they believe uh, strongly that that offer is not one that meets the needs of their patients and they wish to continue uh, to undertake that work themselves and they are entirely free and able to do so. There, there is no compulsion here uh, and uh, that, that I think it's really important that that is clear uh, because I, I do understand and certainly some of our island communities have raised the point that it makes more sense for them to continue to do uh, what they're doing than for a team to appear from the mainland in order to deliver this. And, and I, that makes sense to me too, if I'm honest. Um, so I think the important part is to be clear that it is an, that it is an offer. And for some, uh, certainly for some urban uh, and uh, town practices, uh, so not, not our cities, but towns, then this is something that GPs welcome and want because they believe it frees up more of their time to do some of the work that they, and only they, are clinically uh, appropriate to be doing and to spend more time with uh, patients. Uh, but it, we, we should see a mixed picture here. 
according to what makes most sense for the patients in that practice and what is the safest thing to do. As, as long as it's um, being delivered and monitored, and I just wondered if you were monitoring that and had a sort of picture of how things were being perhaps transformed. We have a, we have a be beginnings of a picture. Um, I don't know, so Lewis, if you want to. I, I, I have to declare an interest in that I, I chair the Scottish Health Protection Network Oversight Group. And what, what that nested under that is, among other things, many other things, is immunisation. And I have agreed with my colleagues in that group that immunisation uptake rates is something we need to be very vigilant about. And any change that threatens the uptake of one of our crown jewels in Scotland, we need to take very seriously indeed. And it's clear from me, from my perspective and my colleagues, at, at this point, even when the vaccination transformation programme is an advanced state, there will still have to be local delivery by GP teams in remote and rural areas. So the issue for me is that needs to be clearly recognised. We need to support that. And it is not something that will just be uh, subsumed into some central team. Having said that, I'm aware that in some places, for example, NHS Tayside, uh, where the vaccination transformation programme has been in place for several years, the uptake rates have increased in that setting and uh, GPs are, are keen to see the job done well, in this case by others other than GP staff. But I, I cannot see that applying in remote and rural areas and we need to support that going forward. I think all I would add, as the Cabinet Secretary has said, has said, is that at the moment we have made no ch changes, substantial changes to the contract in relation to vaccinations and GPs continue to be paid uh, for this. There, there was some prospect that uh, no earlier than 2021 or phase two, we would look at um, how much of the transformation had happened, but there was always an acceptance, always an acceptance as stated in the contract offer that there would need to be flexibility around remote and rural. Uh, if I could just make one point, convener, just on the vaccinations in particular, which I do know causes concern. Uh, it has been portrayed as a step taken to reduce GP workload and that therefore creates the risks that you've outlined. I, I should just say that that's a very narrow portrayal of what vaccination transformation is about. And as Sir Lewis has said, it has been underway in many areas for a, a while. Vaccinations are becoming more and more clinically complex, and that interacts uh, with the workload burden on Scotland's GPs. So future-proofing Scotland's vaccination programme from a public health perspective was a critical driver in this. There is a portrayal of this that, that we are prepared to sacrifice what Lewis describes as the crown jewels for the sake of some modest efficiency. I can absolutely, as the Director of Population Health and therefore responsible for policy on immunisation and vaccination, say that there was a public health imperative behind us looking at how vaccinations were delivered. But there is absolute backstops to say that no vaccination programme will be transferred unless it is safe to do so. Thank you, Convener. Um, I've listened with interest to the evidence and I suppose it's given me a, a better understanding of why rural GPs have such a lack of trust because what's very clear is that the formula was um, devised for urban practice and indeed ignoring the health inequalities we face uh, that Joanne Lamont had pointed out and that they were an afterthought, their funding was protected because it was acknowledged that it would be cut if they were run through the same contract. So I can, and, and the fact that this is being looked at again is not because that was recognised early on, it was because of the outcry of patients and rural GPs that this is now being looked at. I, I want to pick up some of the points that were made because I, I will dot about because other people have asked questions. So if I can turn first um, to the formula and how you're gathering data. One of the things that was said in evidence today was that you were looking at, for example, the number of consultations. Now, you know, I've had experience of both rural and urban GP services. I know if I go to my GP in Inverness, I'll get 10 minutes um, and there will be a queue of people behind me. I also know when I was going home um, and helping to look after my parents that the GP would travel 
a 40 mile round trip on single track roads to do a consultation. Now, if you say to a rural GP, how many consultations did you do today? Well, actually I did maybe four or five and my urban colleague did 40. You know immediately the formula is not going to work for you because it's going to look like you're not doing anything. So no wonder they are not very keen to provide that data to you because the basis on which you're asking for it is not the premise that they're working on. Um, so the, I just make that point because I don't think you can answer that now. I think you maybe need to look at what information you're gathering and how you're gathering it. The other thing, um, and Sir Lewis referred to this, about GPs work in rural areas, that a GP could spend a day with a patient, keeping them out of hospital, but working with them at home. The same is true because they support rural hospitals as well, as medical beds, and I wonder how much cognizance has been taken of that. I think in evidence you mentioned that rural hospitals came under a different contract, but do medical beds and do indeed hospital at home come under that um, same different contract? Um, Mr Fogel will deal with a couple of your points, uh, but before he does that, I think it is very important for me to put on the record that uh, protection was not introduced because there was some recognition that phase one of the contract and the formula was inadequate. If protection, as I said at the outset, has been there for rural practices since 2004. Uh, and clearly for that particular contract, which generally speaking, uh, my understanding is a majority of GPs uh, were not content with and wanted to see significant changes, including uh, GPs in our rural areas. Uh, nor was the current uh, phase one of the contract uh, devised for urban and not caring about equality. Uh, I think we've made it clear that that was absolutely not our intention, nor was it the BMA's intention, the other partner to the negotiation. And of course, the BMA uh, does represent GPs across a range of settings. Uh, but so our acceptance uh, that there are areas for improvement should not, in my view, be mischaracterised as an uncaring approach in terms of remote and rural at phase one of the contract. Uh, areas of improvement uh, and areas to consider in phase two uh, is simply, I think, a welcome recognition uh, that there are, in the implementation of the contract, areas where we need to consider what further improvement should be made. Now, on the point about consultations and about uh, hospital beds and hospital at home, I'll ask Mr Fogel to respond. I mean, I, I think that would just build on, on responses to previous answers. There are always choices to be made about the methodology uh, we use. And all I can say to you uh, is that we absolutely did consider the complexity, as I've mentioned before, uh, about the nature of the delivery of rural general practice. It gets back to a very, very basic point. The value of rural general practice is not expressed and can never be expressed through a formula. A formula is a device of which there are very many choices you might make about how to divide up uh, your resources. Uh, and that is not directly a way of expressing value. Um, and I think those two debates make it very difficult for us to compare uh, and to address some apparent inconsistency. So the methodological point as to whether consultation rates is appropriate is absolutely part of our consideration about whether that is the best way to assess workload. And we have acknowledged that it is not absolutely adequate for that reason. The broader point about whether or not that does or doesn't uh, value through the formula rural general practice, it feels to me I am, I am uh, very regretful, very regretful that the connection between the methodological choices around the formula have been connected so directly with the question of whether or not we do or don't value rural general practice. Uh, fundamentally, the point was income protection, which as the Cabinet Secretary has said, has been a feature and, and has to be a feature of weighted capitation approaches and formula approaches uh, is a standard uh, a feature of such contracts. And previously, under the 2004 contract, it was not portrayed in the way that is now being portrayed. So the reflection for me as to what, ch what change has happened, uh, and again, to look back and, and to look forward to make sure that in future, uh, we, we, we look at how we present that income protection and, and how it is understood. 
but the connection between the methodology, which is very complex for the formula, and the question of whether we value rural general practice feels to me to be nowhere near as direct as it's being portrayed. If you are ignored, um, you feel undervalued, and the, the, first, the contract certainly ignored the work of rural GPs, and I think if you put yourself in the shoes of rural GPs, you would understand why it came out as being undervalued. Can I um, move on um, to an answer given about, uh, indeed about the protected um, salaries of rural GPs? And I think it was Mr Fogo that said that it didn't address things such as expenses, which made m most of the costs of rural GPs um, which I find difficult because property in rural areas is cheaper. Yes, of course, there's more um, miles travelled, but the hours worked are the same, sometimes more, because you have to do your own out of hours. Um, so I can't see that how expenses would be the main difference in, in what it cost to be a rural GP and an urban GP. If, I mean, if, if it's helpful, just so that... Um, I mean, I, I absolutely can be as helpful as possible. Why don't I provide you, based on the evidence base we have, as much clarity as I can about the various differentials there in relation to the cost base in providing rural general practice, also the incomes, etc. I can provide you with, I hope it would be helpful just to provide you with some data after this meeting that would allow us, I think, just to be clear uh, about that point, just because I think there's quite a lot of complexity in that in relation to all the different factors. And we have, based on the, the review work we did, um, uh, some evidence around the, the cost base. Not adequate, as we've indicated, but I can provide you with a summary of that if it would be helpful. That would be useful. Um, can I turn then to vaccinations? And what we're being told this morning is there is no change um, and GPs can go on vaccinating. I'm assuming that that is up to a health board whether or not that happens, because if there is no change, Constituents are coming to me and saying there is change. Um, I've heard of constituents being told um, from not remote rural practices, but rural practices um, outside Inverness, being told that they need to come in to the RNI in Inverness, which is an elderly people's hospital, to get their flu vaccine. And some of them are saying they're elderly, they're frail. That means they have to take a bus in. There's maybe two or three buses a day, which means they're spending the whole day in Inverness, and many of them just are not fit um, to do that. But they are being told they must do that. Um, so I'm, I'm concerned that you're telling us there's no change. People are telling me they cannot access their flu vaccine because they're not fit enough to spend um, an, a, a day in Inverness, far less the affordability of travel. Uh, I think the point was made is there's no compulsory change. Yeah. So there is change. Um, and, and, and as Lewis, so Lewis has indicated, that change is... Uh, complex, and I think best. But, but who's initiating that change? I think is what I'm trying to get to. I don't think it's the GPs. I think it may be the health board. And if they think that's going to save them some money, they're not maybe thinking about the patient experience. So, uh, so the the uh, contract uh, offers uh, the uh, possibility of change, but the key element of that is that any transformation of the immunisation programme in any particular area or sub-area, if you like, of a, of a health board should be done in a way that is safe uh, and also should be done in a way that uh, holds to uh, one of the important uh, elements of our health service and that is that it is person-centred. And so the, the board should be in discussion with GP practices about the best way to deliver uh, immunisation programmes. If there are instances where uh, the, uh, out, the result of that uh, discussion is one where patients are disadvantaged, then um, we should know about that and we should take that up with the board to find out, well, why is that the case? Because that doesn't feel like it meets the criteria of safe and person-centred. If, if, if I may come in on this, mm -hmm. um, just briefly. Um, Equitable is an important principle here, and that is fair and accessible to all according to need. So I would expect any development of a service, and it's getting increasingly complex, as Mr Fogo says, to be safe, effective, equitable, with the accessible, if 
fun function in it, and affordable, so it needs to make the best use of, of public monies. There's little point in constructing an elaborate mechanism if it's going to be highly costly and not make use of best public funds. So I would expect that to be configured into any change in regard to immunisation. But no one, no one principle can be taken in isolation. They all need to be taken in combination and a judgment made in combination with those who deliver the service is the other point. So you heard me mention earlier the communication issue. And I believe that will be vital going forward, that there's a lot of fog of uncertainty around right now. Uh, Frontline teams are not necessarily quite sure of what's going on at board level and at IJB level. So we need to make every endeavour to chase away that fog. It will always remain in places, but we really need to change the weather. Yeah? Can I just one more? Um, you quoted figures, I think, um, for the Western Isles about school children, um, the increase of immunisation going up. Do you have the same figures for elderly people? And have you looked at immunisation across the board? Is it, you may not have those figures with you, but it would be interesting for the committee to have. Um, we don't. It's early days. Very happy to keep you and this committee, if it uh, has an interest in the evidence we have. I should say that the vaccination uh, transformation programme is very complex and is being done uh, in, in a way that's right down to the practice level. So in other words, we are absolutely being clear uh, at a very fine grain level about when those uh, services can transfer. We're also doing it thematically, so we're looking at different vaccination programmes. So it's, it's very complex. So you'll find in some areas they're transferring shingles, in other areas they're not, pertussis, um, uh, you know, flu, there's, there's different things going on. So it's a complex uh, picture. So we, we sometimes have from an area um, information relating to one programme, but not to another programme or to another demographic. So uh, if you're interested, I can provide, if it's specifically about the Western Isles, uh, or indeed more generally, when that information is validated and therefore can be uh, relied on, then I'd be happy to provide it to you. I think more generally, but you did quote from the Western Isles, and I suppose I'm slightly surprised that you gathered one set of figures, which in a way is a no-brainer. You know that most children go to school and they will easily be captured. You don't have the same um, structures in place for an elderly population. And I think if, if I were you, I would be more looking at the elderly population where you know you're going to hit difficulties rather than the ones that you know are probably going to work better. And... Well, I, I mean, I take your point, but I think because uh, vaccinations, immunisation, target a number of different groups and because the transformation programme is moving in different ways across the country, then actually what I would be interested in is... Um, has the transformation programme improved uptake uh, on the target group of people uh, or not? Um, or has it uh, had a negative impact? So, so it's, it's, it's not a, uh, a picture that you can have, the, if you like, with one set of figures for the whole of Scotland. You need to look at um, where, where there is change and what difference is that change making? Um, for the different target groups, for the different um, immunisation programmes. And I programs. would imagine elderly yeah. people would be a target. Yes, indeed. Yes, for indeed. vaccines yes, especially. Indeed. Thank you. Can I ask um, a couple last questions? And, and these have been flagged up to me, so forgive me if I got the technical language wrong, because I think there's an issue about technicalities around this, which are leading to very strong messages about people being unhappy because of the consequence of choices that you've made, and people drawing those conclusions. But I was advised there was a shift from um, an excess cost of supply approach in rural practices to, I think it's called protected income and expenditure. And the argument was put to me that the consequence of that was, although you've been told that people will not, um, you know, income will be protected and all the rest of it, that at some point in the future, it's possible for the health board to come in or the partnership to come in and say, we're going to withdraw that money. And that's creating an insecurity in a system. I wonder if you want to comment on that. And secondly, that the context for this is also that there is a recognition and shortage of GPs. And in that context, the attractiveness of a particular area to work and the capacity to be supported in that work becomes um, another question. And though, therefore, people who are deeply committed 
to their local area as rural GPs are expressing anxiety about the sustainability of these GP practices in the future? I, I will um, answer that, but then I'll also ask Mr Fogo, just in terms of the, um, the, the technical point about whether or not there was a shift from uh, one approach to another. Um, I, I uh, am aware and, and I understand, uh, notwithstanding the fact that the protected uh, income element has been there since 2004, um, and so it's not new, I am aware that there is a concern that because it is uh, described as that and viewed as that, that it is vulnerable to being removed. I attempted to address that. What if the budget shifted over there? There was a shift. You know, it's not that the, the, the model didn't exist, but there's been a shift in the income of the GP in this contract, which makes more of their income vulnerable. Uh, I, I don't believe that to be the case. Mr Fogel may... Uh, offer some more detail around that. What we attempted to do is to maintain the financial recognition that uh, our practices in remote and rural areas uh, require to have a degree of income protection against any formula on the basis that it is difficult for a formula to completely reflect the nature of their practice compared to uh, how a GP practices and the, the work that they do in more urban uh, uh, settings. Uh, I am keen with Sir Lewis's group to look at how we can um, remove that concern around uh, uncertainty as to whether or not uh, that level of income um, will continue or whether it will be removed at some point in the future, and that is part of the discussion uh, that we're having. On the, was there a shift uh, or not, I'll let Mr Fogel respond to it. Um, again, I think a technical uh, methodological change is being used to draw some quite profound conclusions, so just a couple of points that might help understanding here, and again, I'm very happy to, to brief the committee uh, on the kind of technical aspects of this. Um, around the fragility of income protection, um, it is no more or less fragile than any other part of the GP funding. GP funding is set on the basis of allocations from Scottish ministers approved by so this can Parliament. Can you explain to me why we shifted from excess cost of supply so, so, to so, protected income? Right, why so, was that change made? Well, I, I, I and think, then we can work out whether it matters or not, but what, what, why was the change made? So, as I say, that's, that's, the, that's the technical methodological bit. The, 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 the Scottish allocation formula in 2004 had two component parts. One was the workload component and the other was the unit cost component. And we gathered evidence on both. We have a review, published reviews and evidence. We had some evidence, that, uh, and based on the imperative in negotiation with the BMA, uh, that there was a crisis around workload, uh, and we had sufficient evidence to move forward with the workload component of the formula. We did not have sufficient data around unit cost, and therefore we proceeded with a single track formula, removing for this stage and replacing it with income protection, the unit cost component. So I, I, I believe that's perhaps the shift you're talking about. I should say that that does not have a consequential um, impact as the way you've described it in relation to then giving, for instance, boards any more uh, uh, leeway here to adjust funding. I should say that funding is set nationally. Uh, we do not commission GP services locally. Boards, uh, the, the money flows through boards without boards being able to adjust the GMS component uh, of that contractual arrangement. So although the board holds the contract with the GP contractors, the board does not get to adjust that. That is set nationally through national bargaining. So I, I, I think there are two or three things going on in your question that are being conflated um, uh, in relation to methodological adjust adjustments to the formula, which we've explained at length the limits of that and our, and our prospects for improving it, a, a connection to GP funding, which overall, the overall value of the contract increased uh, uh, during the, the, the course of this contract. So it's not just that income was protected, but we added a further 23.7. proportionately went to prosperous practices in urban areas. No, the, the, the second uplift, which is the, 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 the contract uplift, uh, is separate from uh, the income protection. Are you saying that all practices across the whole of Scotland got this equal access and proportionate amount of that 23 million? Uh, uh, what, what I'm saying is that last year 
two sums of £23 million, so £46 million in total was put into the total value of the contract, partly to do income protection, but secondly to provide an uplift to all but practices. Am I right in asserting that of that new money, it disproportionately went to prosperous urban practices as opposed to depend practices in cities and to rural practices? Uh, the, the income protection uh, now... Uh, That's no, I'm not asking you about income protection, I'm asking you about the new money, because one of the strongest arguments we made to us, and I think we found compelling, was that while rural GPs are saying there's a problem here, we're not being listened to on the issues we're facing, the evidence would suggest of the new money that came, it disproportionately went not to rural areas, but to urban areas, and not to poor urban areas, but to more prosperous urban areas, precisely because of the formula or the, the, the choices you made about what mattered most. So, people who live to a very old age, if that's a very important factor, these, proportionately, people who live to a very old age live in the better bits, more, more prosperous bits of our cities. Do you agree with that? I mean, am I right in thinking of that new money that it disproportionately went to prosperous urban practices, not to rural practices and not to poorer practices? And, and the Cabinet said it's quite right to have made this point earlier about the kinds of issues that faced in areas of significant deprivation in the own city, where people have comorbidity, where they have other issues that they bring with them, they've got all sorts of other challenges in their lives. Whereas somebody who, yes, has managed to reach the age of 90 and will have other things in their lives and deserve to be supported, but what the doctor is dealing with is quite different. And the, the biggest question I think we have to address here, and it may be that we run, you know, I really appreciate the amount of time that the Cabinet Secretary has given to this. We'll need to reflect on what we've heard, but I hope that you'll reflect on what we've heard. I think there's a very significant question at the heart of this. Is it the case that the contract as settled on a very small turnout of doctors, it has to be said, um, disproportionately benefits more prosperous areas in urban areas as against poorer areas or rural areas. Because if that is true, then you haven't made an equality impact assessment and you haven't done an island proofing and you haven't done a rural proofing. So the equality impact assessment and the work that was done on the basis of, of the contract as it was negotiated did not demonstrate that that would be the consequence of it. The two areas, primarily in the workload element of the contract, of the formula, is around age and deprivation. And I'm asking you, of the new money, can you give us evidence that that new money went to disproportionately poorer communities and rural areas? My contention is that you can't. Now, if you can, it's different to say we factored in these things. You may have factored these things in, but the consequence, and the argument has been put back to you, and I've not yet had an answer to it, is of the new money, where did it go? Where, how did it break? How was it divided up? And that's not about protection of income, no, no, because I understand. I understand there's been difficult arguments in the past about changing formula, and very often government of any colour will create a floor so that nobody loses, but actually they're losing because they're not gaining from the extra money that's made available. Um, Thank you. Of course, we will provide you with... I think my hesitation is really just to say that the formula component and the income protection is only one small component of the overall contract value. So uh, my hesitation around the word disproportionate is just to be very clear. Around that £23 million, which is not the only new money that was put into the new contract last year, along with the £45 million around the Memorandum of Understanding and the overall contract value, we would need to look at that in the round. So uh, we will provide you with that. I think you should be able to say where the £23 million went and where did it go. And in any um, assessment of fairness and equality, was the money distributed in what might be regarded as an equal and fair way? It must be possible to it, do that. It, it went to the practices with the highest workload. Well, but the, we, then there's a massive question to be begged there because precisely as the Cabinet Secretary has said, round workload is not number. You know, 10 minute visits from da -da -da, 40 people who've really got no other issues in their lives, but there's some particular they need to have looked at in comparison with what's happening in our deep end surgeries and what's happening in some of the complexities around our rural areas. But, I think but, that doesn't, it doesn't stack up. But, Claude, I mean, we, we will provide you with uh, 
all of that information. But workload isn't solely about how often a G or how many people a GP sees. Mm -hmm. It is also about the, the nature of the issues that the patient is presenting, which is how uh, deprivation should be mm -hmm. uh, reflected in that workload there element of the formula. There is a phrase somewhere which some of the campaigners around deep end surgeries use, which is about the perverse allocation of monies. And it does feel perverse to me that a poor community in Glasgow will get less money out of this process or a doctor trying to serve that community than somebody who's doing a very good job and very thorough and a professional job in a more prosperous area. But I mean, I'm conscious I'm taking up too much time. But I think that's something we would really need to get an answer on. And I think we would very much look forward to hearing what's going to come out of um, Sir Lewis's group. And I, th I think I'm speaking for the committee, we're encouraged that at least going to be look, we're going to look at changing the terms of reference. But the other area that I would like some more information on, because I think there's a lack of clarity on it, is the role of TAGRA and why it was not involved at the later stages in this process. Because everybody I've spoken to have regarded them as um, serious people doing a difficult job around resource allocation, and they, they cannot understand why they were not continued to be engaged in the process and un having an understanding of what the consequences of that would be. So I think that would be another area that we would want to look at. Brian? I mean, just on, 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 on your line of question there, Camina, I mean, the definition of workload is, is something that, you know, I think we, we need to read the contract uh, and, and look at that specifically and understand how that was defined, uh, because as the Cabinet Secretary ha has described what our lo workload does, seems reasonable, but I want to see that, that that's actually reflected in the contract. We, we obviously um, need to think, reflect on the evidence we've heard today, and I've already said how much I appreciate the amount of time that you have taken to be with us. Um, I would be interested in hearing the response from the petitioners, and indeed people who are involved in, in GP practice more generally, round what they've heard um, today. And I think we would want them to come back to as a committee. But um, I am concerned. You know, I understand, and, and Mr. Fogel has said, that the intention was not to make him to feel marginalised or excluded from the process. But the reality is, I think the feeling is that people do feel that. And that is obviously an issue that has to be addressed. And if it has been caused by inadequate rural proofing, island proofing, equality impact assessment. I do think that the, the Scottish Government needs to go back uh, and, and look at that. Brian? I think, I think you know, the, the, there's undoubtedly a significant belief in the rural community that the GP contract treats uh, rural practices uh, unfairly. And if we accept that as, uh, uh, as real, even if it's a perception, uh, and also given that there's a retention recruitment issue that's more acute uh, within uh, these practices, I think it's reasonable to, to, to accept that urban practices will benefit to the detriment uh, of, of rural practices. I think also in the evidence given today uh, and the evidence we've received before, I think the consultation process uh, has fallen short of what was needed, uh, as, as well as the data gathering, which I think has made the GP contract was implemented without that adequate data and consultation. So I think more effort had to be made in there. And I think in the evidence today, to be fair, I think the Scottish Government recognise that uh, and do know this and, and that changes have to be made and that engagement with rural GPs and their understanding of their specific concerns is inadequate. But what the but one that comes back to me is, the phrase that comes back to me is, in the meantime, what's happening in the meantime. So I think that that, that, that means that the inequality continues until such times as that's changed. So I, I think there's definitely a lot of work to be done here. I'm conscious that in the other work that we've done, we have heard from GPs about the pressures they're under, and indeed part of our inquiry into support for young people with mental health issues is to speak to, to doctors about the pressure on them um, in order to when they're in consultation with young people who may be um, facing challenges in their lives. So there's a general issue, and which I think I'm right in thinking the Health Committee is exploring, around primary care, so I wouldn't want uh, people to think that we're not respectful and valuing of our GPs generally and understanding the pressures they're under, but I think we we would look forward to get some more a response back you know, from some of the technical questions that we've asked. Um, an update from um, the committee would be really useful and, of course, obviously to hear um, further submissions from those who have, have heard the evidence today. Um, I'm conscious of taking a great deal of your time, Cabinet Secretary, this morning. Can I thank you very much? Rachel, sorry. 
We'll take, yeah. we'll take a bit longer, and then I'll, I promise I'll let you. I do have general questions yeah. very soon, right. and I am I'll number one. one. I'll reach it's one just minute. really brief. Um, I know that uh, in the chamber, Miles Briggs had asked um, for a delegation, a cross-party delegation, um, to get together with the cabinet secretary following the next meeting, which I believe is on the fourth of June with Sir Lewis Ritchie. So, um, just just to remind you of that, cabinet secretary, that that would be very useful. Thank you very much. Okay. Very much. Thanks. And can I suspend briefly to allow Cabinet Secretary and our colleagues to leave the table? If I can call the meeting um, back to order. Um, the next item of business and agenda is another continuing petition. Um, we should have been dealing with petition 1658, which is compensation for those who suffered a neurological disability following administration of the Plosirix vaccine between 1988 and 1992. I'm conscious, however, that we are short of time. We took longer in the earlier agenda item. So my proposal is that we defer this petition and deal only with the, 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 the last petition um, on our agenda in order to ensure that we give proper time and attention to both of these. I wouldn't want to think that we hadn't, because of the pressures of time, we weren't able to explore all the issues fully, if that's agreed. Okay, in that case, if we can move to petition 1672, which is the Scottish Law Commission report on prescription. The, our final petition for consideration this morning is petition 1672 by Hugh Patterson on the Scottish Law Commission report on prescription. The petition calls for the Scottish Government to take remedial action in terms of the law relating to prescription and limitation. The Scottish Government has outlined what remedial action it's taking, which involves updating text to place on its website in relation to prescriptive periods and also working with the Law Society of Scotland on any updated material the Society places on its website. The petitioner considers that this is insufficient, suggesting that simply putting information on a website rather than hard copy, quote, does not address the issue. Members may recall that at an earlier consideration of this petition, back in May 2018, the committee discussed whether there might be merit in some form of awareness raising campaign. 
This is reflected in the submission received from Tony Rosser. Mr Rosser also raises suggestions within his submission that a change in the registers of Scotland's systems and procedures is, quote, both necessary and essential to protect donors. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for actions. Angus. Right. Um, yeah, thanks, Convener. Um, I, I note in the, the Scottish Government's response, it, it, it states they'll inform the committee once the updated material has been placed on the Scottish Government website, but um, that was five months ago. Um, I mean, I, I know the wheels of government can grind exceedingly slowly, uh, <laughs> but I would have thought that they could have got something up on, on their website within five months. Um, although I note the, the petitioner's dissatisfaction with, with that action uh, as well. Um, so, I mean, I've, I've got a lot of sympathy for the petitioner's stance. Um, however, I can't help but think about caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. Mm -hmm. And, you know, while there is an issue with the 20 years, um, given that uh, there's no uh, intention to to change the current situation, I would suggest that the committee closes the petition uh, on the basis, on that basis, that the government has no plans to amend the law of prescription. Okay. Any other views? I mean, it would be possible, and I, you know, I think the, the Scottish government has been clear. I think it's quite difficult to provide information in a way that it captures everybody who might, at some point in the future, be caught up in this. Um, but in closing the petition, we could agree to write to the Scottish Government and make the point to them that they made this commitment and they haven't yet delivered on it. And, you know, that, and that would perhaps at least satisfy um, the petition that that bit of the commitment has been made. Would that be agreed? Yeah. Bina, in having um, exactly these issues in our casework files. And so it's, it's something that I think every single MSP will have come across in this building. Um, and it's just regretful that there isn't a solution necessarily to it that can be implemented practically um, and easily. Okay, in that case, if the, uh, the committee has agreed, we will agree to close the petition under Standing Order Rule 15.7 on the basis that the Scottish Government has no plans to amend the law of prescription, but has agreed to update relevant guidance. We will agree to write to the Scottish Government to make the point that they made that commitment and that we would be expecting them um, to fulfil that. We'd want to thank the petitioner um, for bringing the petition before the Parliament and also remind them that they have an option of bringing back a petition at a later stage if they feel the matter's not yet been, um, if they feel there are matters that they, that they want to pursue further with the committee. Um, so if we can agree that. Okay, on that basis, can I thank everyone for their attendance and I'll close the meeting.